For all of human history, we have looked to the horizon for constants, the sun, the moon, the great bodies of water that define our world. Here, in the vast, arid heart of Central Asia, one such constant was the Aral Sea. It was never truly a sea, but an inland ocean of fresh water, the fourth largest on the planet, a shimmering oasis that for millennia supported a unique web of life and gave rise to a rich human culture along its shores. To be here now is to witness the ghost of that world, to see a landscape stolen from the planet. This is not a story of slow geological change. This is the story of a decision, a story of how in the pursuit of a dream, an entire sea was sacrificed. For centuries, the Aral Sea was the region's beating heart. Its waters moderated the harsh climate, creating a sanctuary for wildlife and fertile ground for communities. It was fed by two mighty rivers, the Amu Daria and the Sia Daria, which carried meltwater from distant mountains across the plains. It seemed eternal, an inexhaustible resource. But in the mid 20th century, the leaders of the Soviet Union saw this landscape not as a sanctuary, but as an opportunity, a blank canvas for a project of almost unimaginable scale. They called it white gold. The plan was to create the world's largest cotton belt, but cotton is a thirsty crop and the desert was dry. The engineers, however, knew exactly where to find the water. Beginning in the 1960s, a colossal network of irrigation canals, some stretching for hundreds of miles, was constructed. It was hailed as a triumph of Soviet engineering, a victory of human will over nature. The two rivers that had fed, the Aral Sea for eons, were diverted, their life-giving water channeled into the thirsty cotton fields. The canals flourished. The sea began to starve. At first, the change was subtle. A few feet of shoreline lost each year, but soon the retreat became a rout. The water level plummeted. The salinity of the remaining water skyrocketed. The fish, unable to adapt to this new toxic environment, died in the billions. The once thriving fishing industry, which had employed over 40,000 people and supplied the Soviet Union with a sixth of its fish, collapsed. The fishing trawlers were left to rust in harbors that were no longer connected to the water. The port city of Moina, once a bustling hub on the shore, soon found itself miles from the sea. Today it is a desert town, its harbor a graveyard of stranded ships, haunting monuments to a lost way of life. But the disaster did not end at the water's edge. As the sea vanished, it exposed a new and terrifying threat, the seabed itself. For decades, the rivers had washed agricultural chemicals and pesticides from the cotton fields into the sea where they settled on the bottom. Now this newly exposed desert, over 20,000 square miles of toxic salt flats was picked up by the wind. Vast poisonous dust storms, visible even from space, began to plague the region. They blanketed farmland in salt, destroyed crops, and caused an explosion of chronic diseases among the local population, from respiratory illnesses to cancers. The very air had become a threat. The water was gone, and what was left behind was poison. Today, the Aral Sea is a fraction of its former self a collection of smaller hypersaline lakes in a vast desert. There are signs of hope. A dam built in the north has managed to restore a small portion of the sea, bringing back some water, some fish, and a sliver of the old economy. It is a testament to the resilience of both nature and the human spirit. But the vast inland ocean is gone forever. The story of the Aral Sea stands as one of the most dramatic and visible environmental disasters of our time. It is a brutal lesson in unintended consequences. A chilling reminder that the line between abundance and catastrophe can be erased with shocking speed. It proves that the world we inhabit is a complex interconnected system.
and it leaves us with a profound and urgent question. Are we listening to its warning?